this is Takia Crystal Kima, and you are listening to the Movie Raid Show. It's time for the movie raid, and tonight's victim is actress Takia Crystal. Kima! That played in several films as well as television. Uh, Sharknado 4, Jackie Brown, In Living Color, and so forth and so forth. Hello! Hi! How are you? What's going on? A little bit of everything. I I got a little scared because I'm in Chicago and there's a tornado nearby. And, you know, it was all uh, fun and shark games uh, a couple of weeks ago. Kind of serious out here now. So you bounce between as well as writing and as stage performance. So are you currently doing any projects of that? Yeah, I'm in uh, development with a stage show called Don't Get Me Started. My big mouth ranting for two hours, uh, pretty much. And and it's got some uh, humor and some music in it to soften the blows of what I think about the world. But I did it once as a showcase a couple of years ago and let it go. And then apparently there's a bootleg copy of it floating around. <laughs> so... A lot of people are, have seen it, and they're asking me to do it again, and so I decided to put it back on its feed, and I'm working on it now, and I hope to debut it in Chicago late this fall or early next year. Now, in terms of emotions in a character when you when you act, whether stage or even on film, do you think it's sometimes okay to hold back some of that emotion, depending on the situation of the character? Hold back the emotion that you're feeling? Yeah, on certain occasions, or do you think you should just straight up let it all out? Oh, definitely not. <laughs> but that we save for therapy. <laughs> when you're performing, you must be in control of your instrument. It's like a singer. Should, should you scream at the top of your lungs to show your emotions? Never, because that will ruin your voice and you won't be able to sing uh, in the next act or the next night curtain. You can have as much emotion or as little as, as you want, but when you're performing, you have to be in control of it. And when you completely let go, you're not in control of it. Where an exception might take place is if you're, you're working on the film, it's the last shot of the day, the director, because, you know, I, I operate from both sides. I, I have an, an actor's hat and I have a director's hat, and the director's not getting what she or he wants, and it, it's obvious that you're holding something back. Because some, sometimes if, if there's a personal connection, it, it's harder to control something if it's welling up in you. And for that last take, the director might say, okay, stop holding back, just let it go for this take. It's fine to do it as long as we all know that it might not be what you think it's going to be for this take. When when I was on In Living Color, we used to do, you know, we had the script and we would shoot and we'd get in the can what was on the page and then Keenan would come down and say to the comedians and me, okay, now for this take, go buck wild. And I would say, I'm going to pretty much do what's on the script. <laughs> but everyone else would go, fuck wild. That means, you know, do whatever you feel like doing. And that's okay once you have in, in the can what you plan to have. But when you're live on a stage, you have to be very careful with that because you can not only injure your instrument, there's no cut, get her some towels, bring your doctor in here. <laughs> uh, you, you must the show must go on, so you have to be very, very careful about that. And even in film and television, you have to be careful that you can afford to let go. Yeah, sometimes it's too costly to mess up, even though you are having fun here and there, but at the same time, it's like, technically, it's not really your money that you're playing around with here. You, you're you on a tight schedule, and uh, yeah, it's great for bloopers, and, but at the same time, it's like, oh, man, we got to do this again, don't we? Right. It's, it's almost never your money, and when it is your money, what I've seen, really a lot less likely to goof off. But then again, you know, and this goes away from that question of holding things in, holding emotion in, because there's a difference between holding emotion in and holding a joke in. <laughs> when, when, when you say, hey, it would be a little funnier if I did it like that, if I did it like that. And that's, that's a, an understanding that you must have with a director, because you don't want to start improv with a director who likes to stick to the script. But you want to be able to improv if you have a director that likes to improv, that likes to say, let's see where this is going. Because that that producer, you know, hopefully, knows that that director operates like that and has room in the schedule to play. Most productions don't have money to have room in the schedule to play. But if you have that room, 
and the director likes that and the actors can improv and yeah have fun why not now you've played in several tv shows uh, as the same character for a long time how do you keep yourself from keeping quality of the character without losing it well what you create and, and, and I create a character I don't just read lines I do research based on whatever they've given me and my own research and then I incorporate whatever new information they tell me like a person for example I'm playing Scotty Decker the contractor and they say well in this episode she's going to sing oh she's a singer now I'm going to do a little backstory on that it, it's like if, if I'm a contractor and I say, you know what, I, I sing a little. But you, you create a real person and, and then it's real. For me, it's a real person. And I can't come out of it any more than I would come out of me being me. You know, it, it's like when you're, you have a conversation with another real person, they don't ever stop being that person if they're sad or happy or mad at you or happy with you. But they're still that person. Once I create a character, it, it is a real person to me. And when I put on that robe of that person that I am that person. Uh, you know, I can do whatever that person can physically do. You think that's kind of lacking in, in some acting today is like they rather they illuminate the character rather create a character before they actually do it, you know, like you said, just reading lines? Well, a lot of people aren't required to do more than that because, uh, and that's why you see people playing the same characters over and over. People are quick to put you in a box and that's why I'm glad I started out in television. I was doing theater for, you know, many, many years before that, but I was introduced to television audiences in a venue where I did many, many, many different characters. So it's harder for people to put me in a box because they know that I you know, I have a, a wide range. But if you see somebody that, especially somebody that larger than life character, that you see do something really, really well, people say, yeah, do that again. And so... You know, it doesn't give that person room to play anyone else. And so if, you know, and it might be a character that that person created, it might be themselves because they were reading lines the first time they did it and using their own possibilities, as I call it, the first time that everyone saw them. And so I think that happens a lot, not through any fault of the actor, but because they're hired to play the character they played last. Time. Now, on the actor side, I think a lot of actors are not well trained because it, it's one of those professions that looks really easy and like everyone can do it. I was speaking, I did a workshop, and in the Q&A, this woman expressed her frustration that she'd written a script and sent it around town. <laughs> no one picked it up, and just because she was attached to play the lead, and I said, well, you know, where did you study? Well, I, I didn't study. I, I feel it in my bones. <laughs> and I used her as an example, but it, that's extremely typical, that I, I know I can do it. I feel it in my bones. I've got natural talent. And I always use the example, would you let me perform surgery on you if I had a knife in my hand and I felt it in my bones that I could perform surgery on you well? No, of course you would. You want somebody who studied and, you know, whether they felt it in their bones or not, who actually knows what they're doing. But in this industry, it's not required in so many instances. That lack of education, that lack of training, that lack of discipline feeds on itself, especially here in America. You go to other places and actors are extremely well trained. They have a, a stronger and wider range to show for it because of it. But here, some actors train, some actors not. And the actors that are not might not know any better than to just read lines if they can even do that because some can't and they're coached to even do that. Yeah, in some cases, uh, even though you may look good as, as the character, but even though you may not have been trained doesn't mean, in this case, you really can't afford to just do whatever and just uh, hope to expect to get big roles and big pictures. Right. Right, and a lot of people rely on their looks, and the industry feeds on that as well. That you know, just stand there and look pretty, honey, and everybody will talk to you, and you'll nod. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll dub your voices. <laughs> we'll you know feed you line by line by line. <laughs> I, I know this one show. I won't say the name of the people, but you know there were you know little bitty kids on the show and they were, didn't know how to read yet so they couldn't study their script and they were fed their lines, line by line and that's understandable when you're a baby and you can't read but something close to 
that happens for simply because they look and how they look and producers don't care if they can act or not. They want that look and they'll do whatever they have to do to support them so that the look is enough. Values is something that's becoming more fragile today, like deteriorating, especially even in kid-related films and TV, because you yourself has been in several of these. Do you think these type of values, especially family-related values, is, is deteriorating? I think it comes and it goes. It's not father knows best. You don't, you don't have that anymore but I watch Modern Family and they have some really good lessons about honor and family on that show the same thing with Blackish uh, which I watch some very good lessons about family and honesty and, and morals and doing the right thing and so you do see it in pockets it might not be consistent and then the other side of that is pushing the envelope to oblivion with how risque can we get how close can we come to pornography without being rated X? How how violent can we get? It's you know more and more and more and more gorier, newer, <laughs> the cursier can we get? Uh, and and because that that seems to accompany some prize. You get the prize for being the raunchiest, the most outlandishly bad, you know, adult without being labeled X rated today. But I. I'm hoping that there will be more of a balance, but if you seek out things, you can find some shows that do have some sort of moral compass. Comparing from the 90s and before then, those were uh, not only just hit sitcoms, but as well as teaching something. And uh, fast forward to now, I mean, you got Goofy, uh, these kids look like really hyped up on, you know, pixie sticks and stuff and just going crazy. The question is, is the value of any uh, family values at all, I mean, where is that at? I mean, we're in a world right now where kids are shooting kids, kids are shooting their parents, parents are killing their kids, and so forth, and rather not just have any more effect from the film world. Well, you know, I I agree, and I think that, you know, so, someone said that it is the responsibility of the artist to capture the highest values of a society, and I, and I take that on. When all of us are gone, someone who hasn't been born yet will look at our art and judge us. If they, they might the Constitution, they, they might leaf through the files that show our court records, but they will. They will definitely look at our, our art and judge us for it. And so I think that that comes with the responsibility of, of saying, how do we want the earth to view us? And so it, it's up to us first, the artists, to say, let's do this. We artists who are director, producer, creators of our own art to say, let's make a movie about this. Let's, let's make a television show. Let's make a play about this. That's certainly what I do in my work. If you see, and, and I, you know, I've done some things that are off brand, so to speak. <laughs> Especially, you know, when I was younger on A Living Color and things like that. But largely, I, I have a bar. My bar is, would my ancestors be proud of this art that I've put into the indelible continuum, or would they not? And if they would not, there usually is not enough money in the world to make me do something. But if they would, then I, then I rush forward with it. And that encompasses some things that are not necessarily lofty, but, but have some value, because comedy has a value even when it's silly. I, and I, myself and other people who've told me, I've gotten through hard times because you made me laugh, Takiya. Uh, watching your show X, Y, and Z got me through the war, got me through my cancer, got me through blah, blah, blah. I remember after I was really, really sad and, and in mourning and thought, I'll never laugh again. I believe that about myself. I was sitting down and my sister put in a Tyler Perry movie tape, and I had never watched one of his movies before, the, the stage movie. I'd seen his, his films before, but I'd never seen a movie of a stage show. And I sat down, and I was looking at it like I was watching oatmeal. And the next thing I knew, I, my face felt funny because I was laughing. And it shocked me that I, in fact, did possess the ability to laugh still. <laughs> I love Tyler Perry, by the way, because of that. But that's the purpose of comedy. Even when it's silly, it has a purpose. So there's a wide range of things that are, to me, are acceptable as long as they're not hurtful and denigrating of a people or, or, or if, of any group within a society. But I, I think that that path, the battle, we as artists, how we step forward, how we reject things that we find objectionable, and I've certainly done that on virtually 
every show I've been on. I've, I've raised my hand and said, mm, this, this offends me. Mm, this makes old pe- older people, elders look bad. Mm, this, black people don't do that. Mm, is that. I think that's more sexist. Nobody else thinks that. So I, I am the one that will raise my hand, even if no one else does, to object to things. But that's only half the battle. The public has to meet us halfway in how they support our art. If you bootleg the fine family-friendly film that that the independent artists struggle to make it out, and then you run first weekend to see the bloodiest, uh, most lawless blockbuster, then that's what's going to come out next summer. Another gory, you know, high concept, you know, low low moral blockbuster, and that filmmaker is going to retire and go back to the post office because he didn't make any money, he's not going to get a green light, he's not going to be able to make the next film. So the public has to demand that the media raises the bar back to wherever we want it as, as a society. Yeah, it's about making an imprint in history itself uh, with art, film, art, uh, music, anything in general. It all depends how people look at these. Either a lot, a lot of, at least this day and age, it's mostly offensive, supposedly, and uh, things go in the wrong direction, especially in other countries. They don't exactly fully understand it, and they think it's, you know, something going against their own country or whatever in terms of trying to explain it it seems like there's a little bit of a gap because you keep releasing these types of films that may offend these countries especially and uh, you still keep releasing them and you're not exactly explaining yeah. them very well and you're doing it on purpose and, and to me I mean, I, I'm going to tell my story I'm going to tell stories about what I know I don't write stories about things that are foreign to me I can write I can write a sci-fi thing that that is completely out of my imagination but I'm not going to write something about a real thing that is foreign to me because it's not mine why would I I, I can I can write a, a Russian story but it would be about my trip to Russia other than that it's none of my business it's not my story to tell so why would I and if I dared to do that the only honorable thing to do in my opinion is to research it to death. And when all the research is done, to get an in-house consultant that connected to the culture of which I'm writing. Other than that, I believe it is, it must be my purpose to be disrespectful. If, if, if I say, I'm going to write the Mike story today, I'm not going to, just based on the sound of his voice, yeah, I'm just going to make the Mike story. You're, gonna, you're probably going to be offended because <laughs> I don't know anything about you. So... It, it, when I when I make that decision, I'm being rude. I'm being dis- dishonorable. I'm being disrespectful, and and I should know it. And I've said this before, but this is a real hot issue now. There are literally nothing but remix coming out and reboots, so-called reboots and spinoffs that are from these big companies that are being very desperate, uh, in my opinion, very desperate, trying to hold on to a franchise. People are getting really angry about this. Do you think that this could lose influence on the viewers on how females, or maybe even actors themselves, thinking it's a little bit too easy to even act now because it's just basically remakes? Well, doing a remake doesn't make acting easier unless you're remaking your own role. And even when you do that, it's like theater. I mean, you could call a run of a show, you know, an opening in the 99 remake. So I don't think the actor's job becomes easier because the story is familiar. Romeo and Juliet is familiar, but everyone remakes it. Uh, Do you know what I'm saying? So I don't think that that's a question for the difficulty in the role of an actor. An actor who is doing her job will work to do the job successfully. In terms of the audience's appetite, I think that it's dictated by the studio's comfort level. They remake whatever they're remaking because it's popular and they don't want to risk the millions and millions of dollars that it costs to do a studio film. And so they do what works knowing that it will work again. We liked it the first time, we'll like it the second time, we'll like it the third time, we'll probably like it the fourth time because it'll be new actors and then we'll we'll say, well, maybe so-and-so can be the next James Bond, and then we'll see it again. <laughs> so I, I think that even though I have that reaction, really, they're remaking that? Uh, sometimes it's a good thing because sometimes 
people, especially young people, don't want to see that original version. And if it's a quality film, if it's actually art, just like with a play, you want to introduce it to new audiences. And sometimes it can only be introduced to new audiences through new productions. So although I do wary of it, I, I understand it, and sometimes I even appreciate it. They, these are products that, when they made a huge hit back then, let's say 1985 and so forth and maybe it didn't get good reviews at that time but end up being a cult classic later on for future generations as as we just mentioned and now um since they're remaking other films uh, some of them just really don't need a remake but they still do it anyway because at that time it was popular and uh for some reason they just want to still make money off of this by remaking everything but but the people that see these films now won't realize there was a original at the time right Right. You know, it, it, it's new to them. It's new to them. I hear that over and over, especially with music, with, and I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but it's happened so many times where I'll hear a song and, uh, and one of my young nieces and nephews will say, oh, that's so-and-so. And I'll say, that's who? Oh, no, honey, that's Marvin Gaye. What kind of influence do you want to imprint on other actors? I'm not sure what, what that means, but what I'll tell you what came to mind. I, I like working with actors who make me step up to them. Because, you know, actors, and we talked about actors who are trained and not trained, who, who work and not work. And some people, you know, do things in their sleep. If I've been doing something for a while, I can phone it in if, if I wanted to. But I like to work with actors who bring it and who make, who force me to bring it to, to step up to their level. And then there becomes not a not a bad competition, not not a you know, we're showing each other up kind of thing. But but how good can we get together? Kind of competition. That's that's what I love. And so if I can bring that out of another actor, if I can get an actor to to play with me in that way, so that we can do more. You know, what what is that? The sum of us can be greater than our part. Then that's golden to me that's heaven yeah that, that that's something that should be held by every actor to to get the very best in the acting regardless how big how small the role is the fact is even if it's a small screen big screen or even stage performance you want to get out there f to, for people to see more of this for to m know more about what you can do with other characters yeah yeah i have this habit of especially if i've seen something once the second time I see it, I look in the background. I look for the smallest characters, and I watch what they're doing. I, and, and maybe because I'm a director, I'm a producer, I'm thinking, how would I have shot this? What, what angles would I have used? What would I have told those people in the background? What would I have had them do? But I watch to see if actors are just sitting or if they're really in the scene and what they are doing. And to me, it, it makes a big difference because when, when you see a film a really good film, a film that lasts, there's nobody in the background goofing off. There's nobody in the background phoning it in. Everyone is working to the best of their ability, and that's why that film, that, that show, is considered a classic because everyone brought their A-game to every scene. Totally agree. Well, go ahead and plug in anything that you would wish to plug in, any promotion, anything, any shows that you want to do, that you're doing right now, or anything in general. Sure. Well, I would love for people to hear my many upcoming projects, and if you can uh, go to my website, which is www.tkeyah.com, that's tkeyah.com, and find lots of information there and links to my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages. My blog is there and some, you know, fun facts about me and lots of pictures. And what you will see eventually there is <laughs> news on my new stage show, Don't Get Me Started. I am in a college romantic comedy that's coming out in November called What Happened Last Night, and I am producing a film called Revival. It's a feature-length musical that will be out next spring, and I have some other uh, projects that are in various stages of development, <laughs> which uh, people will know is an interesting term, but it's true in my case. And people can watch me right now on uh, in Sharknado on the Sci-Fi Channel, and of course 
uh, the usual suspects <laughs> in Living Color and That So Raven are on in various uh, times of the day and night. And you can also access that schedule on my website, takia.com. And there you have it, actress Takia Crystal Kima.